They spare, they spare no expense for you, baby. Tell they you spare, what, they yeah. spare no expense for me. It's unbelievable. Between the ferns. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Between the ferns. Right. We're on three, two, let's do it. right, you guys, we are rolling into another episode of the Candace Owens Show. You know, the internet is constantly trying to tell me what to do. But liberals can't bully me, and the internet cannot make me do anything except... Very recently, everyone was flooding my mentions, telling me, you must have Larry Elder on your show. <laughs> Here we are. Larry Elder, welcome to the Candace Owens well, Show. Thank, th- first time I should thank the mob. For, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought I would I would bend to the blow of the mob, but right. they had a good idea. And um, many people don't know this, but and I talk about this a lot on the Blexit tour, but a lot of my thoughts were fathered by you and the internet. And when you come out as a conservative and you look at your skin color and you're black and you're mm-hmm. not allowed to be, you sort of turn to the internet and look for people to tell you it's okay. Mm-hmm. And there was that striking video between you and Dave Rubin um, where you talked about father absence and it just instantly red pilled me. And I knew that I was onto something and that I was going to be right. That was probably the interview that I did, Candace, where I got the most reaction. And the, the exchange was when Dave Rubin was going on about institutional racism. And I said, like what? And he hit, it looked as if he'd been hit in the head with a two by four because he was used to saying things like structural racism, systemic racism, institutional racism, and nobody saying, what specifically are you talking about? What is your data to suggest that there's something such as institutional racism? And he had nothing. And he realized that he needed to recheck his assumptions. And so I got him on this journey to, uh, to rethink his assumptions. And now he's, uh, I'm not sure he's a, a small L libertarian like I am, but he's getting close to it. I think I think he's a libertarian or a conservative, and he just hasn't said it yet. Yeah. Um. And that that was his moment, though, and he talks about it all the time, and he's become a great friend to me, and I've been on his show, right. and we talk about that, and and that's why you think if if you look at it objectively, their liberalism is almost like a mass brainwashing. Like mm-hmm. I, I really do feel that when I listen to these people, they are parroting talking points, but when you get to the substance of it, right. there is no substance of it. It's mm-hmm. just well, black people were slaves. You have to acknowledge that at a certain point there was systemic racism. Mm-hmm. That's kind of like where it comes from. Right. And the media, I think, plays the biggest role in that and the education system. And that's what I try and do. One time I had Steve Miller on my program. Steve Miller was uh, a guest on my show when he's like 14 years old. First time he'd ever been on radio. And mm-hmm. as you know, now he's one of the top aides to uh, Donald Trump, one of his principal speechwriters. And after he'd been on my show a number of times, he and I were talking. And I said, what is it about my show that you like? He said, you have the ability, Larry, to change people's minds. You don't just talk. You bring facts, you bring information, and you put it in a, in a way that people can, can understand it. So I, I'm very proud of that. It's not just me yapping and bitching and moaning and whining about what I think is unfair and what I think is not, is not fair and, and, and all that. I'm trying to get people to rethink their assumptions. And hopefully, hopefully we're, we're doing that. Well, you drag people to the cleaners. I mean, it's just like you don't step to Larry Elder unless you have the facts. I think that's like. Don't go on Judge Judy's show unless you have the receipts. That's exactly right. Don't come on on Larry Elder's show unless you have the facts. You're like the Judge Judy of of conservatism. Bring bring the facts. Where you're like, yeah, you don't play with Judge Judy. That's right. I would love to. We got to get Judge Judy on this show. You don't play with her. And she knows her stuff. And she's not not here to play any games. And there needs to be more of that. And that's when I realized, because at that point, I had had the feeling, but I didn't have the facts. I had to actually research and realize, wow, because you hit on the, the total myth of police brutality. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I was like, well, we can't acknowledge, we can't say it's not happening. Here's a video, here, here's an entire video where we're watching Philando Castile be murdered. And yet you just said, what are the facts behind this? Mm-hmm. What is going on behind this? How many blacks are act- actually being murdered by police officers? And of course, when I did my research, higher chance of being struck by lightning. That's right. Right. Uh, the Washington Post did an analysis of how many people were killed by the police uh, in a recent years, a thousand of them. 500 of them were white, 250 were black. There were more unarmed white men killed by the police than unarmed black men. I was invited to um, Ohio State to give a speech before the football team by Coach Urban Meyer, then the coach. He called me and he asked me if I'd come in to talk to his players. And I said, Coach, are you aware that I went to University of Michigan? And he paused for almost 10 seconds. I thought I killed him. So I came to the, to the, to the uh, class um, and I addressed all these football players and they were like this, Candace. They were not having it. They were not having it. Black and most, conservative. Mo- most of them were black and they were all like this. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they thought it was Uncle Tom and a sellout and all the words you've heard before. Yep. And I said, there were about 16 unarmed black men killed last year by the police. And you can probably name the unarmed black men that have been killed in recent years, whether it's Eric Gardner or Freddie Gray or Trayvon Martin. I know, the, I know he wasn't killed by a cop, but he was killed by a, um, a guy that purported to be the, the neighborhood watchman. Uh, uh, Sandra Bland, we all know their names. Michael Brown. 
I said there were more unarmed white men killed by the police than unarmed black men. Name one. The room was silent for almost 20 seconds. See, that's that Larry Elder thing where you're just like, you realize you don't know anything. And when you talk to cops, Candace, they will tell you they are more hesitant to pull the trigger on a black suspect than a white suspect. Mm -hmm. And this has been documented. There's an economist named uh, Roland Fryer. He's uh, at Harvard. He is so brilliant. He's one of the, I think he's the youngest tenured professor at Harvard ever, no matter the subject. And he did a, a, a study on whether or not the police were using uh, deadly force against black people disproportionately. And he assumed he was going to find out that they were. He was shocked. He said it was the most uh, shocking and surprising finding of his career. Wow. He found out the police were more hesitant to pull the trigger on a black person than on a white person. And there was another study done by some researchers at a, at a university in, uh, in Washington that, felt the same, that found the same thing. It's just a lie. And the police uh, and um, uh, the feds do a survey called the, I think it's called the Police Public Contact Survey every two or three years. They ask people if you had any interaction with the police. And if you did, tell us about your interaction by race, by gender, by whatever. And it turns out they can't find any pattern of of discrimination against black people. And I'm not saying that there aren't bad cops, obviously. There are bad talk show hosts. There are bad uh, uh, doctors or bad lawyers. They're bad people. But but a systemic planned out institutional kind of thing, the data are not there. And you know it's not there because if it were, there'd have been class action lawsuits against the police by all these black lawyers who are around, uh, who are making this argument. Right. One of the things I was really interested in is just the detrimental effects of these sorts of lies where people don't realize that the people that negatively impacts the most is always the community that they're trying to help, right? So Mm -hmm. you create this entire narrative and, and what happens? Black people start raising up. We start burning down our own neighborhoods. Um, you have black police officers that are negatively impacted by it right. because they're even being called Uncle Toms and Coons just because they're pulling someone over. Um, and I had a police, a former police officer here discussing that, how it impacted the black police officers. Um, and I have this theory. I talk about this all the time. There's something about progressive policies and progressive perspectives that always lead to regressive results, right? And we could take this anywhere. We could talk about police brutality. We could talk about other things like there's, uh, you know, the whole idea um, that black people and white people now, they suddenly don't want black and white people to get married. Like one of the things when I announced my engagement that I got as comments, right? Mm-hmm. This was stunning to me, right? Of course you're marrying a white person. There should be black on black love. I'm like, so literally, let's just do miscegenation laws again, right? Blacks and whites shouldn't be yeah. allowed to get married. Yeah. Of course, we need safe spaces for black people. We have black only dorms in America right now. That is literally so progressive, it's regressive. That is segregation. By a different name, it's segregation. And it's astounding to me that people don't realize that we're going, that means the Supreme Court was wrong when they decided Loving versus Virginia and struck down the anti-miscegenation laws in the, in the South. They were wrong. Right, they, they, were should, right. they shouldn't have struck them down. They should have put them back up. That's exactly it's, it's what absurd. they're saying. And regarding what this, uh, the damage this, this uh, false accusation does, the police pull back. Once you call them racist and they're, af- they're afraid that if they pull somebody over who's black, they're going to be accused of racism. They may even be prosecuted. They may even lose their pension. They're going to pull back. And when they pull back, crime goes up. Mm-hmm. So outside of uh, Ferguson and St. Louis, uh, where Michael Brown was shot and killed, crime went up. Crime went up in Baltimore after Freddie Gray uh, was killed. Uh, crime went up in Chicago. The very people that these people, Black Lives Matter, claim that they're, that they, that they care about, those are the ones who are hurt the most. Right. Why, why isn't Black Lives Matter out here in South Central Los Angeles dealing with the Crips and the Bloods? They're because killing each other. Because it's black on black, and mm-hmm. that goes against the narrative, right? 6,000 black people were killed last year, almost all of them killed by other black people. Right. As opposed to a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of unarmed black people killed by the police. And unarmed, by the way, does not mean not dangerous. Michael Brown was unarmed, but they found his DNA on the, on the officer's gun. He was charging, trying to get the gun. Right. So even if you're unarmed, doesn't mean you're not dangerous. But uh, the point is, those are the ones that we care about when an unarmed black person is killed. Let's deal with them on a case-by-case basis. Almost always the officers are either exonerated or they or they can't get a guilty plea. And that's because most people recognize that what officers do is dangerous. They have to make split decisions uh, at, at crucial times. And uh, you have this big presumption of innocence, and you have to find them guilty by uh, by beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's hard to do that. So your facts are racist, right? That's what they, that's what mm-hmm. they tell you. Your facts are racist. Right. And, and the one thing that the black community hates the most is black people acknowledging that our community as a whole has an issue, right? Mm-hmm. Black on black crime should be discussed. Over 90% of all the killings are black on black, right? right. So why, why do you think it is that our community ne- never wants to hold the mirror up to ourselves? Because that would then mean blaming, uh, blaming the victim. Uh, that's what, that's how they see it. It's easier to yell and scream about racism than it is to look at black people and say, we have to change our behavior. We have to do better. Right. And we have to, we have to raise our game. Uh, you remember when the dream team, uh, uh, 
destroyed the whole world in the Olympics and we won by 40, 50 points. The rest of the world didn't say, let's lower the hoop. Uh, let's uh, widen the hoop for us. They got better. They raised their game. And the rest of the world is no longer getting destroyed the way they used to. We need to raise our game. We need to graduate from high school. We need to stop having children outside of wedlock. We need to uh, to uh, do the right thing by the children that we bring into the world. And we're not doing that. That's exactly right. And we're not competing. And what I think we're suffering from also is this, we have no self-confidence. We don't think we can't. Like we've been sold. And I think from a, the time that we step into school that we can't, right? Here are the reasons you can't. We are handed so many excuses before we even get out into the real world that it's, be, it's become a plague on black America. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about that, Ken. It's not your fault. It's because of slavery. You don't have to worry about that, Larry. It's not your fault. It's because of Jim Crow. You don't have to worry about that. What you right. do need to worry about is how angry you should be at the white man, right? right. The white man, because of what they did. I've never been a slave in this country me saying that on cpac <laughs> stage went viral and, and and these black publications were so angry well candace has never been a slave i literally have never been a slave in this country i cannot there, relate there, there goes the argument for reparations right right there it is and, and look i i think I, I i could be pro reparations i think we should allow people the opportunity or or the chance to go back to africa i would i would sponsor <laughs> that like you wouldn't believe i don't think you can have a long line right i, I don't think we would either but you know they, they, you hear that all the time in theatrical voices they took us from the motherland do you know what's going on in the motherland say have you been to africa i've been to africa okay i'm perfectly content living in america the, most of people don't realize like you, the opportunities that you have here in america you'd have never had otherwise and this was actually one of the first countries that banned the slave trade right i mean britain was ahead of us the uk was ahead of us but america was just right behind them by, by the way when you mentioned that uh, the uk was ahead of us they were do you know that the slave owners were compensated after they lost their quote unquote property, the government compensated slave owners. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so when people talk about repar reparations, do they really want to have that conversation? Because like it or not, slavery was legal. And so their property, their legal property was taken away from them after the after the Civil War. So uh, you can make an argument that the people that are owed reparations and not only just black people, but also the people whose, quote, property, close quote, was taken away after after the end of the Civil War. So what do you make of um, and, and by the way, that's why there was no war in the UK. Right. The, the, the slave owners got substantial amounts of money. That's fascinating. And you look at the amount of money adjusted for today's dollars. It was a great deal of money that the former slave owners got, which is one of the reasons they didn't fight a war. I can't wait to look into this. I, mm -hmm. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. The slave owners were given That's why the great Eldersky's here. Oh, my God. That's so amazing. I'm so interested in by, that. By the way, the last time I was on CNN, one of the last times I was on CNN, I mentioned a poll <laughs> that was done by CNN and Time magazine in 1997. Um, and black teens and white teens were asked about racism. And not too surprisingly, most, most of them, both black teens and white teens, felt that racism was a major problem in America. Um, but then blacks were asked, is racism a major problem, a minor problem, or no problem in your own daily life? 89% Candace of black teens said racism was a minor problem or no problem in my own daily of life. Course. In fact, more black teens and white teens said failure to take advantage of available opportunities is a bigger problem than racism. So I mentioned that to Don Lemon the last time I was on CNN. That was the last time I was on CNN. Oh, Don Lemon. Yeah, exactly right. He's, he's almost Don, had me on Don a few Lamont. times. Don yeah. Lamont. He's had me on a few times. He, he picks his guests very carefully because he, he likes to believe he's the smartest person in the room, but he's, and I, I think he's a total intellectual coward, to be honest he's a, with he's you. He's a victocrat. He's one of these well-groomed, well-dressed, well-paid young black people that sit around and talk about how difficult it is for you to do what I've done. Right. And he's, and he's said some stunning things about white males and, and yet he's, he's dating a white male. He's, he, I think he called them all. Maybe it wasn't predators, another word that he used. And I, I, I recall it. It was yeah. just stunning to me because he's literally dating a white male. So I, I see scared when he goes home. You know, I don't, I don't know if it's, it's a certain region of, mm -hmm. of where we should be afraid of white people. Um, but the entire debate has gotten insane. And, and, and to me, when you see people step to the stage, like Elizabeth Warren, and she's offering reparations. <laughs> it's, it's actually, like, no, 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 no. She think? wants, she wants us to have a full throated national debate. Yeah. About reparations. Let's do that right now. Let's have a full throated national, not a regional uh, national yeah. debate yeah. Yeah, about reparations, yeah. which means what? Stop pro promising black people handouts every election cycle. Right. It actually drives me insane. And more insane is the fact that, I mean, and, and I think it's less and less. I have to say, I think black America is finally trending in the right direction. I walk down the street, black people come up to me and they say, you changed my mind. Or I think I might be a conservative. I'm right. like, yeah, I think we all are mm -hmm. if, if, when you get into it. But it's just so stunning and it's so insulting that every four years, it's just free stuff. Mm -hmm. We're going to promise you free stuff. Right. We're not going to have a discussion with you about the issues, the issues that your community are facing. We're not going to talk to you about what Larry Elder might tell you or this and that. We're just going to offer you free stuff. So take your poison. Would you like a Jay-Z concert? Would you like a Beyonce concert? Or would you like reparations? Which maybe after we have a full throated national conversation about it might amount to $400 on the weekend, mm -hmm. like for you to go to the club. 
I've, I've been on radio for 25 years. In 25 years, I've not been able to get Jesse Jackson on as a guest. I haven't been able to get Al Sharpton on as a guest, even though I've tried. I haven't been able to get on Louis Farrakhan as a guest, a guest even though I've tried. I was able to get one so-called black leader on my show. His name is Kwesi Nfume. At the time, he was head of the NAACP. And I said, Mr. Nfume, as between the presence of white racism or the absence of black fathers, which poses the bigger threat to the black community? To his credit, he said, without missing a beat, the absence of black fathers. And that is the number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five problem in the black community. And a kid today uh, is less likely to be born under a roof with his mother, biological mother and biological father, than a kid during slavery. In 1965, 25% of black kids were born outside of wedlock. Now that number is almost 70%. You cannot blame that on slavery. Clearly, uh, 2019 is less racist than 1965, which is less racist than 1865. That is the number one problem facing the black community. And forget about Larry Elder. Obama said a kid who does not have a father in the house is five times more likely to be poor, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in jail. It is far and away the number one problem. Now, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that problem other than tell people to change their behavior, change their attitude and behave more responsibly? Right. Well, I also think that the source of all that, all, all of those statistics is really our marriage to the government. That's what happened. Mm-hmm. If you want to talk about systemic, I always say, uh, you know, is there systemic racism? Uh, yeah, there's a noose and you can hang yourself with it. If you want to go and take from the government, yeah, you, you'll find it. It's, it's been systemized to make sure that you will never, ever get off of the government mm-hmm. handouts. I know that because I lived it. Right. Um, I, I literally have family members that are trying to figure out how to scam the government so they can keep this small check without realizing. Mm-hmm. And the government sets it up that they don't want to get rid of it. The government comes to you and they say, here is a thousand dollars a month that I will give you, right? If you make more in your real life, you make a thousand and one dollars. We're going to take your a thousand dollars. Now you only make one. So, I mean, you understand why they develop this mentality of, well, I can't make a thousand and one dollars. But then your whole life, you're not making more than a thousand and one dollars. And you see that in our community. It's so pervasive and no one wants to talk about it. And this this system was created by an avowed racist, Lyndon Baines Johnson, right, who is celebrated in our textbooks as a hero to black America. Okay, Margaret Sanger is celebrated in our textbooks as a hero to black America. She's celebrated in museums, just so you know, museums in D.C. I can't remember which museum I went to a few weeks ago. And it was honoring Margaret Sanger as like this woman who just brought the word forward. She is on record as an avowed racist. She hated black people. She wanted us exterminated as weeds. And we are learning to celebrate her. Yeah, she believed in eugenics. Uh, eugenics. Let me give a let me give a mild defense of LBJ. LBJ gave a speech where he talked about about, uh, welfare (laughs) dependency. And he said, uh, he feared it. He did not want people to become dependent. He, he naively thought that the wealth, that this war on poverty would make people less likely to be dependent. Um, uh, uh, FDR said the same thing when he announced his uh, New Deal program. He did not want people to be, uh, uh, he called, uh, he called welfare a subtle narcotic that destroys initiative. Now, they were wrong about the effects of their, pl- of their plan, but their intent was, I, I believe, to motivate people. No, I don't think LBJ, because LBJ has that quote, and I've looked it up, and it's not disputed by the left or the right about saying that basically we got our voting rights, and he wanted to make sure he could give us something, just a little bit, you know, to keep us yeah. under their spell. And he said he would have us voting Democrat for the next 200 yeah, years. Yeah, I, know, I know the quote so you mean. He could have been I know, quote, I know the quote you mean. He was talking about the uh, the um, uh, social programs. Right. Um, and he thought that that would cause black people to be voting for Democrats the next 200 years. Right. Uh, and he's not wrong about that. But he did not, in my opinion, intend for black people to become dependent and, and less less successful. That was not his goal. Mm, I think that's a matter of debate. So he could have been talking out of both sides of his mouth, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, and he just he just hated black people so much that I can't imagine that he intended for us to get off of our feet. Well, he was certainly uh, not the most uh, progressive person when he was in the Senate. But but for Lyndon Johnson, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 wouldn't have, wouldn't have passed. Yeah, but there's even a little bit. Of, you you could go back and you could say that he basically had to sign it. Like America was burning down, all right? He had just stepped into office mm-hmm. and it was like, sign it or don't. Mm-hmm. And then after he signed it, it was like, well, now how do we get control of black people? I think he was like a, an avowed racist. And um, there's, just a, there's just a lot of evidence in the, in the way that he was speaking about us using the N-word all the time. No, you could say that that was just. That wasn't unique to the time right. that he was sure, in. Sure. Unfortunately, it sure wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't the only president yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was using that sort yeah. of language. Uh, uh, Jack Kennedy is, is celebrated by the by the left. There's a book called The Dark Side of Camelot. He said some pretty nasty things, too. Really? He was angry at some uh, one of his ambassadors. Uh, and he said, um, if that guy doesn't stop, I'll send him to one of the boogie republics, referring to, referring to Africa. Wow. He also very badly treated Sammy Davis Jr. Sammy Davis Jr. postponed his wedding. Who was, he was going to marry a white woman, a white actress. Because he knew that it would hurt Kennedy with the South in 1960. Uh, and, uh, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. worked real hard to get him elected. Uh, Kennedy got elected. Uh, 
Sammy Davis Jr. got married and was disinvited from performing at the inaugural. Interesting. He wasn't, he wasn't um, uh, invited. He was invited and then they took his invitation away. And that's because uh, L, uh, JFK was afraid that having uh, Sammy Davis with his white wife would alienate uh, members of the South, even though he'd already won the election. It was hideous, hideous and racist. Interesting. So let me ask you a question and, and, and to move this to a time of today. Do you think that the Clintons are racist? Do I think they have an inferior? Do, do, I, do I believe Clintons uh, deep down in their hearts feel that black people are inferior? Yes, I do. I think so, yes, too. Yes, I do. And you look at the things that allegedly were said by Hillary, um, all these um, uh, state troopers who used to provide uh, security for them. There's one named Patterson who wrote a book about her mouth. Uh, Bill Clinton had a longtime mistress named um, Dolly Kyle Browning. She also wrote a book about how uh, both Hillary and Bill routinely referred to blacks with the N-word, yeah. uh, Jews with the K-word, uh, 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 mentally handicapped people as retards. That's how they spoke. Interesting. And, and we know that, uh, that uh, Hillary said to her former campaign, her husband's former campaign manager, his name was Paul Fry, Bill Clinton ran for Congress and lost. And his manager was a guy named Paul Fry. Hillary was so angry at him, she called him an effing Jew bastard. And, and Paul Fry said that she said it. His wife said that she said it. A staffer heard it through a closed door. The New York Post offered uh, Paul Fry a polygraph and offered Hillary a polygraph. Paul Fry took it, passed it. Hillary never took it. I asked um, Dick Morris uh, about this. And Dick Morris said to me on, on radio, let me put it like this. When I was working for the Clintons in, uh, in Arkansas, I asked for more money. And Hillary said, that's all you people care about, meaning Jews. And Dick Morris said, I paused. And then I said, by you people, do you mean political consultants? <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah, I've always felt that way. And I, I always try to be super hesitant to use the word or to brand somebody as a racist. But there's just something about when I watch her and I watch the way that her and Bill deal with our community and other communities as well, that I think that they quite literally view us as inferior. Well, they also view us as, as emotional children. Right. You can just say something and get them to react. Uh, Hillary does that all the time. We've been proving them right, she's, though. She's always, always playing, playing the race card. She mm -hmm. refers to the birther uh, movement as a racist lie. I know. Her campaign started it. Sidney Blumenthal went to um, uh, a guy named James Asher, who works for the McClatchy newspapers, and said that uh, Barack Obama is from Africa. Put some people on it and track it down. He said, so because of that, we put people on it. We couldn't find any evidence of it whatsoever, but it was Hillary's campaign that started it. And now she that. says with a straight face that, that it's a, that it's a lie. It's a, it's a, it's a racist lie. Her campaign started it. Promise you they did. There's a book called Game Change written, co-written by a guy named John Heilman. He was on Morning Joe a few years ago. And they were talking about this with Harold Ford. Harold Ford is a black congressman from Tennessee. He's now a retired congressman from Tennessee. And he said, oh, I, I've never heard that. I, I don't, I don't, I, I've never heard anybody say that. And John Heilman, who co-wrote the book, didn't say a word. And finally, Morning Joe turns to him and says, well, John, you wrote a book about all this. What's the truth? <laughs> and he said, I am confirming your theory that uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign started the birther movement. They, oh, they started my goodness. I wish I had it. known this because so many people bring it up to me and they mm -hmm. say, how can you defend Trump? And of course, I say, first and foremost, I don't think it's exactly racist to question where somebody comes from. Um, but I never knew that it was started by yeah. Hillary's oh, yeah. campaign. Sydney, Sydney Blumenthal. Look it up. I'm totally going to mm -hmm. look it up. That's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. yep. and I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like I've learned so much, definitely, in terms of I've obviously I feel like I've grown up politically in front of the cameras. And, and there's so many different things that I'm learning. And I'm trying to really understand if everybody, every single person on the left views the black community as stupid or if or if we've wrongly been proving them right. Like we, we could say they Good think question. the black community is stupid. But how have we been acting? Good question. Right? We're giving our votes to people and we, we're calling the other side racist. We don't know our own history, right? We've been acting uneducated. We've been acting emotional, right? If they can drum up Black Lives Matters and get us screaming in the streets, burning down our own neighborhoods, mm -hmm. do we have the right to be offended until we change the way we act? Candace, 90% of black people thought O.J. Simpson was innocent. <laughs> what is that? What is that? And during, and during that trial, I said to myself, Funny. what does that do to the people that look at black people? What does that do to your level of respect for black people? It goes down. This evidence is overwhelming. The man did everything but leave his business card at the crime scene. <laughs> and, and you're telling me he's innocent? It's <laughs> Are you smoking something? He Hair, did. fiber, <laughs> blood, motive. And he didn't do it? He didn't leave his business card, though. <sighs> 
he did not leave his business card. So maybe, maybe he was innocent. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I know. And, and I, it hurt. It hurts me to say that. But sometimes I'm just stunned at the debate and how easily we fall for the bait and, every and time. There, there was an extraordinary piece in the New Republic at the time of the trial called Race, OJ and My Kids by a high school teacher in New Jersey. And he said during the trial, he had 110 students. Almost all of them were black or brown. Nobody, but nobody believed OJ Simpson actually did it. And whenever anybody would suggest that maybe just maybe the evidence suggests this or that and the other, they'd be shouted down. He said none of the women had any sort of sympathy for Nicole. In fact, they were angry at her because she was white and married O.J. Simpson, who had a black wife at first. They had zero sympathy, didn't care about the facts, didn't care about the information. It was all about getting the cops and uh, and uh, allowing one of us to, to, to get away, given all the bad stuff that the police have done to us. Well, I think what we're getting at, what we're really getting at here, though, is just that black people have been seized culturally. And and we believe that when someone calls for, go, comes for our cultural icons, right? Like, who do you think holds more, more weight in the black community? LeBron James, when he puts in a Beto cap, or you debating this intelligently and telling us the facts around it? What do you, LeBron James, when he puts mm-hmm. in a Beto cap, they go, oh, I, I must, I must support Beto then because LeBron James said so. I must support Beyonce because she's wearing an I'm with her t-shirt. OJ Simpson, oh, he's so good at football. Right. He couldn't have killed anybody. He's really good at football. Mm-hmm. And that's really, it's, it's sad to me that we, we actually need new idols in our community. And, and, and that was done by the media. They, Hollywood, they created this balloon of Hollywood. I really do believe this, that they invested. The DNC is in lockstep with Hollywood. Democrats are in lockstep with Hollywood. Every single person in Hollywood that's a star is a conservative. And if they're not there in the closet and they are hiding or they will lose their entire careers. And in many ways, they're able to use the media and our idols as a tool to make sure that they get black people to continue to do what they want. Like they're puppets. People in Hollywood are actually puppets. And and they're they're persuading our community against itself. I asked you, I'm like, why would you care who Beyonce is voting for? Mm-hmm. What is, what intellectual gravity does does Jay Z have for you when the, he because the, he raps? The good news is that the, the information seems to be that most people uh, get their influences from their mom, their dad, uh, 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 a relative, a member of the clergy, a teacher. So yeah, uh, you have all these stars who say this, that, and the other, but most people uh, learn how to behave learn their values from people around them, close to them. And that's why it's so important for there to be a mother and a father in the house. That's exactly right. And that's what I said. So that what the, I think what the left did really successfully um, is it's first time you, you break down the black family, right? And so norm, in a normal setting, yes, you get your ideas from mom and dad. They tell you what's right and what's wrong. Mm-hmm. When you remove fathers from the home, you're still going to pursue that paternity elsewhere. Right. And where are you going for that paternity? The streets, hip hop, Jay-Z mm-hmm. is raising you now. Your music is raising you and mm-hmm. telling you what's right and what's wrong. Right. And then the third vertical that, that you turn to is education, the education system. So if you don't have mom and dad at home, what, what, are, what are your teachers telling you? Well, teachers are telling you that Republicans and Democrats switched and it was called the Southern strategy. Right. And suddenly they said, ooh, let's go on this side and I'll go on the other side. We're learning that. We're actively learning our history that's, that's, wrong in school. That, that creates an uphill battle for people right. like you and me. That's what I learned. I never I never learned about how the uh, Republicans as a percentage more than voted for the Civil Rights Act of 64 than Democrats did. I didn't know that Democrats opposed the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know Democrats founded the Klan. I didn't know that until I got a lot older. The same for me. I yeah. didn't learn it until uh, these last three years. Mm-hmm. I didn't learn it until these last three years. I went through an entire education system and I did not learn that. It is a revisionist history. Mm-hmm. What is the solution for it? Vouchers. Better schools. Yes, school choice. Um, I my school. I went to four high schools. Um, the one I graduated from was called Crenshaw High School. If you saw the movie Boys in the Hood, that's my high school. Oh wow! Right now, three percent of kids in my high school can do math at grade level. Three, not thirty. Three. What responsible parent sends their kid to a school like that if they have options? The answer is nobody would, but they don't have any options. You're assigned to that particular school. Right. Uh, the money should follow the child rather than the other way around. And uh, there's a, a program called the DC Hope Scholarship Program. They got set up in D.C. several years ago, mostly black parents there. And every two years, the funding runs out and the Democrats try to pull the funding. And what happens is the black parents take to the streets, have press conferences, and they back off. But uh, the graduation rates are higher. The test scores are are better, reading and math. And the um, the dissatisfaction of parents is through the roof for these schools. And they're oversubscribed. About four times as many people want to get in as can get in. And instead of expanding the program, the Democrats are trying to shut it down. Well, what, what, what role do you think the church plays in all of this? Well, um, the church played a, a heroic role in the civil rights movement. Almost all of the uh, the leaders were from the clergy. The problem is, uh, now that the civil rights movement is over, uh, most of us, for the most part, have our rights. I've got civil rights. That's right. <laughs> the question is, what do we do now? And saying, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, doesn't do it anymore. Uh, I, I used to belong to a club in Cleveland, and uh, it's a private club, and most of the uh, employees there were black. 
And so I'm walking out one day, and this is in 80, 84, 88, I can't remember which one, but both both years, Jesse Jackson ran for president. And the black uh, attendant who who's in the pool room came up to me and he said, Mr. Elder, what do you think about the prospects of our Jesse Jackson for president? Because of the way he said it, I knew he liked Jesse Jackson. I'm not a fan. The prospects of our Jesse Jackson. So I didn't quite know what to say. I wanted to say something diplomatic, but I didn't want to lie to myself and lie to him. So I said, I said, Arnold, I just don't think he's qualified. And he said, Mr. Elder, me neither. He's in the we shall overcome business. And you know what? We done overcome. Oh, I love this that. This is in the 80s. Right. I love mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So let me let me ask you this. Do you think early on, Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton's, their heart was in it for the right reason, but perhaps since all of this funding came to them because there was actually a problem and actually an initiative, and now it's like, well, what do you do once your problem and your stream of income has been fixed, right? Like if, if your whole thing is, this is the movement, we need civil rights, and then suddenly there is civil rights, you got to kind of have to create non-civil rights or you got to go the other way and say, Jesse Smollett, are you available on Monday you know, that, to execute that's, that's, a hate the, crime the, on yourself? That's the economics of racism. Right. Uh, when the demand for racism exceeds the supply, you have to go you have to find new sources. You have to find new sources. <laughs> you have to find new sources. And is that perhaps, yeah, like, that's what did, it is. were they doing real things in the beginning and now they're yeah, sort of... Yeah, I mean, of- at one time, uh, Jesse Jackson was an aide to MLK and MLK and he had friction. Mm-hmm. Uh, MLK thought he was a hothead. And told Jesse Jackson, at one time, at some time, you're going to get your own ind- individual niche. But in the meantime, leave me alone. That was an exchange they once had, according to a book called Thunder in America. So I think that at initially his heart was in the right place. But then things change. Rather than accept the victory, the civil rights movement, you got the good guys won. Let's now convert the troops to, to, to civilian duty, to peaceful duty. Right. They act as if it never, it never happened. Right. I recall reading an article about um, one of the Black Panthers. I think it was Huey Newton. And he said, this is in the 70s or 80s, and he said, things are so boring now. And I, and I said to myself, this guy preferred it the way it was in the 60s? Right. You preferred us to be out in the streets and rioting? You preferred that to right now? I, I think that, yes, so many people are addicted yeah. to the drama. They're, they're just they're, they're addicted bored. to they're the bored. drama and they're, they're bored. bored. And, and because, because elevating black people now requires hard work, telling them to be responsible, telling them not to blame other people, and that's hard work. It's much easier to, to point to somebody else and say, here's, here's your plight. Here's why you're, you're the way you are. And that's why they don't want to do this. And that's why people like you and me are considered to be evil, because right. considered to be enemies. Right. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? I'm guardedly optimistic. I used to say guardedly pessimistic. Now I'm guardedly optimistic. Hey, I, 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 I think, when did it change? I, I think that I, I believe in the, in the iceberg theory. I believe that the captain uh, in the Titanic, had he known the iceberg was there, would have taken evasive action. We just have to convince people there's an iceberg, right. and then they'll take evasive action. And evasive action means not having kids outside of wedlock, uh, getting married before you have a kid, making sure you at least finish high school, and ideally finishing high school with a degree where you can read, write, and compute at grade level, right. which means vouchers. Right. But beyond that, though, the education system, I think the entire thing needs to be revamped. That's the one thing that I struggle with the hardest of what what are we actually going to do about the education system? Because I know I'm a smart girl. I was brainwashed, too. Well, it's not right? the money. We know it's not the money. And there's, we, we spend more money K through 12 than any other country on the face of the earth. It's except unbelievable. Except for Luxembourg and Switzerland. So it's not the money. Right. It's, it's definitely not the money. And, and, and mm-hmm. it, But it's even just the topics are shifting now. Now they're teaching kids that they can pick their genders in kindergarten. Think about that. Right. They think about that. What, where, where we're at right now, you can pick your gender in kindergarten and this is what they're fighting for in my classroom. I was forced to take feminism 101. You know me, I, I hate feminism. I am not a feminist. I am the proudest non-feminist you will ever see in the face of the planet. I'm leading the non-feminist movement <laughs> in the world, okay? Because right. it's all, it's, it's, it's a mess. It's right. nonsense. It's similar to, it's a Black Lives Matter. There's nothing there of substance. Mm-hmm. Men and women have equal rights. Actually, I would say, I would almost make the argument that we've got plus, right? I'd much rather be a woman in society today than to be a man in society. And, and Candace, for eight years, um, Michelle Obama would come out and talk about how women work and make less money uh, for doing the same work that men do on the dollar. And it is a lie. It's a complete lie. Even the Department of Labor said this is not true. It's a lie. And you compare apples to get, apples. We actually get paid more, right? But yep. we're going into different career paths right. and, and then women are shocked. Well, there's a wage gap. Yes. If you decide that you want to knit for a living or if mm-hmm. you or if you want to be a feminist dance teacher, right. you're not going to make as much as Dr. Ben Carson, who's a literal brain surgeon. Right. If that shocks you, right? You're, <laughs> right if that totally shocks you, then you're going to be in for a surprise. We've got a problem. We've got a problem, yeah. got a problem got a right? Problem. Way right. bigger problems. It's like when I had the Black Lives Matter guy here and he was he was doing his whole BS. I said, tell me what the problem is on the different races. I was Larry Eldering him. 
I was like, name one thing the Republicans have done that is racist today. And he says, of course, voter suppression. Wait, well, he said voter voter suppression. And, yeah. you, and you went, you mean voter ID? <laughs> he's, like, he's, like, he's like, we got to jump through all these hoops. We got to bend over backwards. Voter, voter I'm like, suppression, you mean, suppression. It's suppression. Oh, you mean voter ID? Right. Like, yeah. I'm like, so if, if we've got way bigger fish to fry. If we can't you, figure out how to get asking, an ID, we you, shouldn't be you voting. Ask, if you ask if you knew anybody who didn't have ID. Yeah, I'm just, I just wanted to know. Do you know anybody? Because you can't do anything. You can't go to the club no. on the weekends. You literally cannot do anything in this country if you don't have ID. And it undermines black people when you say that you're not smart enough to get an ID. And then it suggests that any person in the world should be voting. If you can't figure out how to get an ID, you probably are not exactly understanding the political landscape right. today. Right? right. Yeah, I mean, like, seriously. <laughs> exactly. like, and and, 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 and it, it's it's just such a frustrating conversation to have with people because they don't, they don't see <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most ridiculous. And, and look, I like Hawk. I think Hawk's a nice guy. I just, you know, I, I told him, I'm, look, I think you're a great guy. You're just, you're wrong. You know, I don't, you're just passionately do, wrong. Do you think you moved him? Do you think he changed anything? Yeah, I mean, like, well, look, we still text, we still ping him. And, and he says, you know, I, I will say one thing about you is that um, when I read about you in the media, I'd, it's almost like you're just pu- being a puppet. When you sit across from me, of course I believe what I believe. And I don't, I genuinely don't know what you're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. You actually have bought into the fact, and I'm going to say you, I mean, Hawk and, and people that are like him, that black people can't do anything. That's sad to me. Someone sold you that. Someone sold you the idea that you can't do anything and you're wearing it like a badge of honor. I think I can do anything, right? This feels better. When I'm telling people you can do anything, you can get over anything. My grandpa did it in a seri- from a segregated South to where he is today. I have nothing to complain about. Look at the latitude that this country gives black people. Um, I was watching a, a commercial yesterday with Samuel Jackson. Samuel Jackson has a bunch of commercials. So does James Earl Jones. So does Morgan Freeman. All three of them have made vicious comments about white people, vicious comments about Republican Party, vicious comments about the Tea Party. Uh, recently, Sam Jackson went off on a, on a, on a profane, profane rant against uh, Donald Trump, calling him an mf or mf or mf Disgusting. A bunch of times. Who can do that and still have a Capital One commercial? Only black people. Name, name, name a, a conservative commentator who would have gone off on Obama, calling Obama an mf or and retained any endorsements. None. Zero. No, no, no. We have, there, there is black privilege in this country, by the way, if anyone wants to talk about it. But that's mm-hmm. exactly what mm-hmm. it is. I just mm-hmm. say to myself, I read articles and what I like to do, my favorite challenge is to replace the word black with white. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, or, or replace the word white with black. So I, say, I saw, I saw white you do that men, with Sarah John. Yeah. Right. Like <laughs> white men need, need, need to just stop what they're saying. Imagine if this article said mm-hmm. black men need to just shut up. Mm-hmm. Heads would roll. People right. would be fired. But for some reason they've condoned. And, and Dr. Thomas Sowell talks a lot about this. Um, where like there's this like this fallacious concept like because you've lived through something you can now do whatever it is you've lived through like like okay black people have survived racism in this country so now we can just go ahead and be the racist and actually there is a lot of racism against white people in this country right now that I see with clear eyes right mm-hmm. I'm just I read articles and I go how is this allowed how did this make it to print it's so obviously racist how does Al Sharpton show his face let alone have a TV show on the weekends on MSNBC. This is a guy who made his bones by lying about uh, a rape, right. accusing a white man of raping a black teenager. Uh, he was in the middle of the Crown Heights riots in New York that one Jewish leader considered to be the most serious pogrom in the history of this country, where he basically egged on black people to attack Jews. Uh, he was involved in the Freddie Fashion Mart, a similar kind of thing. In the streets of Ferguson, before one uh, word of testimony was taken, yelling, no justice, no peace, he owes $5 million in taxes. And here he is uh, every every weekend on MSNBC. It's it's amazing to me. It's such a joke because he's saying what they want what they want him to say. And that's all they really care about. Give it six minutes and Jesse Smollett will have a show on MSNBC too. Give it six minutes and they will say Jesse Smollett. It'll be called the Smollett Hour, right? And he'll <laughs> Last time I was in, uh, I was in D.C., I did a bunch of, New York, I did a bunch of shows on Fox. And I met one of their... Uh, contributors who happen to be a Democrat, and I like him, and he always seems reasonable. We're having an off-the-record conversation, and I said to him, please explain Al Sharpton to me. How can you guys support this man? And he said, I can't explain it. I consider it to be reverse racism. That's what he said. Wow, it's not uh-huh. reverse racism. It's just racism. It, it's 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 <laughs> it's what you said about this black privilege, right? It, there mm-hmm. there there definitely is black privilege <clears throat> in this country, and they mm-hmm. say, "Oh, you're Uncle Tom, you're a coon." Mm-hmm. We are we are as a whole on the community not very nice to white people right now. But I will say this: it's not black, just black people. The white on white crime is even worse on the internet. I mean, the way that white liberals go after white conservatives as if it's a token, it's virtue signaling of the of the highest plight, right? Mm-hmm. And and they say, "Well, I feel good about myself." 
we don't even have to be offended because we have white liberals that are offended for us. Right. Policing the internet and telling us what to be offended by because they undermine us so much that, shh, don't even say anything, black person. I'm offended for you. That stuff drives me absolutely bonkers. Mm -hmm. The white guilt thing, it, I mean, like... I got like, I want to like lead the black conservative movement. Then I want to destroy feminism. And then I need to like solve, come up with a solution to the white guilt thing. That's right. like, that's like my, my 2019 schedule. Mm -hmm. White guilt phenomenon. I genuinely don't understand that they hate being white or do they just feel so good when they yell at other white people for blacks and Hispanics? Well, and it just shows you the, the zero tolerance for, for anti black racism. Uh, against white people. Uh, there's a writer named John O'Sullivan, who's a longtime editor for the National Review. And he said, white racism exists, but its social power is weak. The social power against it, overwhelming. And um, that's what I see. Uh, white people feel guilty about slavery. They feel guilty about Jim Crow. Uh, they really want black people to do well. But a, a lot of black people don't perceive that. They, right. they think they're, they're, that they're out to get them. Uh, LeBron James once said, before he went to St. Vincent's, uh, St. Mary's, his, the high school where he, um, uh, where he went for a while, the Catholic school, the first time he ever been around white people. He said, I thought white people hated us. I thought they were all against us. And so I had the same attitude against them. He said that? Yeah. Until, until he uh, went, to, went to Catholic school and realized there were good white people. But he assumed because he had never been around white people, everything he read about white people was that they were out to uh, oppress black people, suppress yeah. our rights. And he said, I was shocked when I found it wasn't true. And he still kind of bears that a little bit. He, he The residual effects he's got, of that. He's got a lot of victocrat in him. He does yeah. a lot, right? And, it, and it's sad because, and I look, I've been actually very nice to him because I think that he, uh, in other in other ways, he he's really good for the black community, right? Married his high school sweetheart. Right. He's an amazing father. And right. that stuff to me is the most important. He's most important. In terms of leading by example, I think he really is, but this is a man that is so politically ignorant. I mean, he he knows absolutely nothing about politics, and mm -hmm. yet he he tries to tell us how we should vote or how we should feel. I mean, remember when they came after Trump for saying that LeBron James was stupid? Anybody else watch interview? interview? Yeah, of those two, it, it's hard to make Don Lemon look look smart, right? It is hard to make Don Lemon look smart. LeBron James did. You, you said Le that I did. No, okay, it is hard. And, and here, here's the thing: I watched this thing, and I'm sitting here going, "LeBron James, poor guy, is opening a school. Not a good idea." I've read Dr. Thomas Soul. The idea of just giving people and, and saying you're all going to go to college it's not going to help us mm -hmm. be competitive. We got to step into the real world at some right. point. So he's so proud of the school. Don Lemon doesn't care two cents about this school, LeBron James. Don Lemon has got one job from CNN, and it is to get one sound bite about Donald Trump. So here he comes, Don Lemon the puppet, looking up, checking out the school, talking about all the things that are going to be great. And then he just he goes in for the kill, you know, and he asks a Trump question. Nobody even knows and, about the school. And isn't it amazing how, how Trump is disliked so much by people like Don Lemon? Here's a guy, Donald Trump, who wants to do something about illegal immigration. There's an economist uh, from Harvard named George Borjas. He's probably done more work on the impact of legal and illegal immigration than any other economist in the country. And he says there's no question that unskilled illegal aliens uh, compete for uh, jobs uh, held by unskilled uh, blacks and browns living in the inner city and puts downward pressure on their wages. And he's also hired, uh, Trump has, a uh, Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, who wants vouchers. Right. So here you have a, a, a president who wants to give inner city parents the choice to, so that they don't send their kid to a, a school where only 3% of kids can do math at grade level. Here you have a president who wants to do something about the competition, uh, the illegal and, un and unfair competition posed by illegal aliens uh, to jobs for black and brown people. And he's a, he's a racist. Right. If that's racism, he needs to go back to racism school. Right. I, I said, I said, if, he, if Trump's a racist, he's failing at it. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's the worst racist that there, there's ever been. And unemployment for blacks, uh, all time high. Un yeah. uh, unemployment all, rate, time, all, all, all time, time low. low yeah. All time low. Uh, has never been this this good because he got rid of some of the stupid regulations that Obama put into effect right. and lower taxes, which Obama did the opposite of. Obama gave us the worst economic recovery since 1949. Even Tavis Smiley said under Obama, by every major economic metric, blacks lost ground. And... Um, and Donald Trump's a racist. Right. It, 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 with no evidence, yeah. no proof. I'm no. just, I say that all the time. I'm, I'm willing to have my mind convinced. Just put, the, where's the proof? What has Trump said or done? No one can, well, no well, one can answer when the I, question. When, I, when I've asked that question, someone called up and said, well, he signed a consent decree in 1975 in which he agreed not to, uh, continue the practices. How far uh, back? Uh, against, they go? against, against would be, would be black and, uh, and brown tenants. 1975. Google uh, Donald Trump and Jesse Jackson. Google Donald Trump and and uh, and Al Sharpton. Rosa Parks. All these people hung out with him after 1975. So whatever happened, they apparently were not dissuaded from dealing with Donald Trump. Right. What about 1974, the year before that? Chuck Schumer, according to a guy named Jay Homnick, who I've interviewed him a number of years. You should get him on your show sometime. Okay. Jay Homnick, H-O-M-N like Nancy, I-C-K. <clears throat> 
1974, Homnick attends a, a political meeting with his father. Uh, this was in the neighborhood of New York called Flatbush. And there were two buildings that had black people in them. And the neighborhood wanted them out. Not because they were disrupting, they just wanted them out because they were racist. So here comes Chuck Schumer, 1975, for a newly admitted lawyer from Harvard running for office. And Schumer said this, if you vote for me, I'll propose a plan to refurbish these buildings. The blacks will have the right of first refusal, of course, but they won't be able to afford them because we'll make them so nice, they'll be uh, priced out of their price range. So they elected him. He did it. He proposed the scheme. Turns out the black people were able to raise enough money to move back in. So the whole thing failed. But it wasn't for lack of trying. Right. And this is 1974. I've never heard Chuck Schumer ask about it by anybody. Interesting. Mm -hmm. If I ever see him, you know, it'll be the first question I ask him. Mm -hmm. That this, I, I have this thing that the people that are shouting racism the loudest, the racists. I mean, that's just it's, it's the truth, and and they ignore everything that they do. They, they're all they've got a bunch of pretenders on their right. side. Beto pretending to be Hispanic by calling himself Beto. Elizabeth Warren, who literally cheated her way through life by pretending to be a Native American. They're both running for president. Right. It's stunning to me. Like, and nobody cares. They don't care about their history because. The media has convinced us that if you're on the right, you're a racist. And, and this is what we have. This is the uphill battle. And it's not just the news organizations. Here's the thing that I ask all the time. What the heck happened to black TV? I grew up and I was watching the Hudstables, the Jeffersons, Nick at Night, the Winslows, mm -hmm. right? I, I, these people had goals. It was about family togetherness. It was about problem solving. What, what is black TV today? We have love and hip hop, Larry. Love and hip hop. I couldn't tell you. I don't watch it. Okay, you, you, <laughs> I couldn't there's tell nothing you. to watch. It's it, it's literally love and hip hop. There mm -hmm. are people. They have baby daddies, and they're trying to see if they can make it, and they can become rappers. I mean, Cardi B was birthed out of love and hip hop, right? right. She's a stripper, gone rapper, um, and this is what we have on TV. So even just think about what black people are watching. That is setting our goals on TV. I was not watching that. I wanted to be just like little Ruby Hutstable, right? <laughs> I just wanted to have a nice life and it was okay to want to be a doctor. Yeah. Now it's hoop dreams. Hoop dreams. You want to be a rapper or do you want to be, do you want to be a basketball player? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be a football player? Good. That's your place in life. It, it is a problem. Uh, the average black parent is far more likely than the average white parent to think his or her kid is going to play professional sports. They, uh, you see it. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've lived it. They, mm -hmm. they, they all, that's what they, they live for. They want their kids. They don't even talk about it. I was talking about this with my fiance the other day. The impacts, the long-term impacts of like football, the science behind CTE stuff. And, and mm -hmm. mo uh, there are so many parents who say, my child's not even going to play football, right? My child's going to, going to play soccer or deal with something that's non-contact because of the long-term effects. But they're so convinced that it's worth it because their kid is going to be the next wide receiver for the Giants. Mm -hmm. When the odds are overwhelmingly against it. Overwhelmingly. And and uh, you look at the average amount of time spent uh, on homework in an Asian household versus a white household versus a black household versus a Hispanic household. Again, night and, night and day. And you wonder why the Asians are making better grades. They're spending a lot more time on homework than blacks are and, and browns are. No, oh, oh, let's be clear. The Asians are doing the best in America right now, and nobody wants to talk about them mm -hmm. because they destroy the concept that there's racism, right? right? They completely destroy it. Japanese Americans, where we had them in internment camps, mm -hmm. now they're doing the best in America. How did that happen? Because they work hard. Because right. there's no such thing as Japanese lives matter. That's why. There were there were even laws that forbade Japanese from owning farmland in California for a number of years. I didn't know and, that. And here they are. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I, I see it. You know, I've had yeah. Japanese and Asian friends and their parents, you get home after school and they make them do hours and hours and hours of homework and studying homework. This isn't even homework. They just want them to study. They want they're, they're studying numbers and all it, the time. And every year there's a hue and cry. If, if not enough, black people are nominated for Oscars. Right. Uh, and I've had black friends who are actors. And I said, why is this important? And they said, well, it's important for black people to have positive images. Black people have higher self-esteem than white people do. Almost every test has shown that for, for decades, black people have higher self-esteem than, than white people do. Black women, black women are far more confident about their bodies than, than white women are. White women are obsessed with this Barbie doll kind of waist, and black women are not obsessed with that. So don't tell me that black people have low self-esteem. We have very high self-esteem. Right. Uh, and um, as you pointed out, Asian Americans, uh, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, uh, Korean Americans are making more money per capita than almost anybody else. Right. Where are their images on TV? Where are their images on the screen? I love that. Years I ago, years that. ago, there was a woman named Debbie Debbie Thomas. She was the first black woman to get a uh, Olympic medal in in uh, ice skating, and she was always asked, "Who is your role model? Who is your role model?" And finally, she said, "Look, I don't have to see somebody black do something before I think I can do it." Fast forward, she's now a doctor. 
wow. in, in the Bay Area. Right. And that was her goal all along. Right. I love I love that Dr. Condoleezza Rice always says, you don't have to tell me how to be black. I've been doing it my whole life. Right. right. Like suddenly, like I'm not black anymore because I'm a conservative. Even Obama said that. He said there's more than one way to be black. Right. Even he was uh, called all sorts of names. When Obama ran for Congress and was defeated by Bobby Rush, the former Black Panther, Bobby Rush uh, basically characterized him as a uh, effete uh, a snob who taught at at University of Chicago, who went to Harvard, uh, and essentially called him somebody who wasn't uh, down with the black people, didn't understand. Right. right. The thing is, if if he had held on to that and and it was just successful and didn't turn towards the end of his administration right. and start making it about black versus white, and and he could have been that. That is why I did cry when Obama won, because it did mean something to our Course community, it right? Course it it did. meant something, and then he completely destroyed it in the end. He did a one eighty. The first time I saw him give an interview, he gave an interview to uh, Steve Croft, sixty Minutes, and he was still not the front runner, but he was gaining on Hillary. And Croft said, Senator Obama. If you don't get the nomination, will it be because of racism? And I went like this. Let's see what this guy says. And he said, no. If I don't get the nomination, it will be because it will be because I've not articulated a vision that the American people can embrace. Wow. And I went, wow. Wow. This is a different Democrat. I don't vote for tax, spend, regulate Democrats, and I won't vote for this one. But at least he'll be a different one. Right. Fast forward, what happens? Uh, the Cambridge police acted stupidly. If I had a son, he looked like Trayvon. Oh, and by the way, we have problems here in America called Ferguson. He hired uh, Eric uh, Holder, his AG, who once said, when it comes to matters of race, America has been a nation of cowards. And Eric Holder has called uh, voter ID an example of pernicious racism. Right. He's called uh, the fact that uh, blacks get longer sentences, uh, and they do so for legitimate reasons that judges take into consideration your entire criminal history. Right. He called that an example of pernicious racism. Right. He called the fact that black boys get kicked out more often than white boys do in schools an example of pernicious racism, never mind their behavior. This guy has been a more dangerous race card hustler, in my opinion, than even Jesse Jackson and right. Al Sharpton. Because he's good at it. Suit and tie, uh, speaks, and, and speaks calmly, mm-hmm. and people have much more um, respect for him. That's exactly right. And so he's a great orator. You, know, you have to dangerous. give him credit. Yeah. He is dangerous. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I'm sitting here. Some, so many people say that Trump destroyed Obama's legacy. Obama destroyed Obama's legacy. It was him. What legacy? I mean, it, it, worst economic recovery since 1949. Well, when he I walked in, out. though, he meant something. He could, he could have actually brought America together, mm-hmm. right? And, and, he, and then he turned into a puppet. It was. It, I actually actually never felt that Obama was actually in control. If I'm being honest with you, I felt like there was money behind him. He had to, he took out a lot of money in order to run in the first place, and that he was never actually fully in control. And that's why I fully embraced Trump because he sort of came in there as as a billionaire, a business guy, uh, calling shots his own way. And I, I think in the end, I don't know. I don't really. I, I, I'm not too critical of Obama because I do think he served a purpose and it makes it easier for me to have these discussions with black America when I talk about the differences between Obama and Trump. Well, we had the skin color. We got what we wanted, right? You got the skin color. You got the black man in office and nothing changed. And now things are changing and we have this person that is a white straight male that is in office, right? And it forces you to kind of look in the mirror and really see what it is that you believe in and why you Mm -hmm. vote the way that you do. So in in many ways, I, I wouldn't undo Obama, right? I think Obama candidates was kind of schizophrenic. Um, <laughs> when when Obama ran, uh, it was a big article in either Time or Newsweek, I forget which one, about him bringing in all of his advisors um, to make the decision to run. And the article said race never came up. I don't think Obama th- thought of himself as a black person. I think Obama thought of himself as a badass. Right. Uh, but then he got into office and he realized unless you get that 95% black vote, you're not going to get reelected. How do you get that? You keep him angry. Keep talking about racism. Right. And so he was stuck. He wanted to get reelected, but he also realized that if he told the truth that racism is not a major problem in America and black people start thinking about schools and education and crime and the other things that other people think about, they wouldn't have this allegiance to the Democratic That's Party. That's exactly right. So he was stuck. Right, right. What do you think? What are you thinking for 2020? What do I think? What are your predictions? I think Trump will get reelected. Okay. I, I don't care who he runs against. If he runs against Beto O'Rourke, he's going to crush him. If he runs against Elizabeth Warren, he's going to crush him. The only person that could give him a real challenge is Joe Biden. And Joe Biden can't survive the nominating process because he's too centrist. What do you mean by that? He, uh, the, the Democrats right now, their base is $15 minimum wage, Green New Deal, abolish ICE. World ending in 12 years. Right. World ending in 12 years, abolish ICE. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the Green New Deal. Um, Overturning the, uh, the, the electoral, electoral college. college. Right. Uh, that's not where, 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 uh, where Joe Biden is. Uh, Medicare for, Medicare for all. Joe Biden is not there. 
he is considered to be too old, too white, and too moderate for the Democratic Party. Right. Uh, if he could leapfrog the caucus in the nominating process and, and get uh, and get nominated, uh, he would be a formidable challenge to, to, to Trump because Trump uh, took states that Joe Biden is strong in. Uh, Joe Biden is considered a blue collar guy. He, he's from from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, Trump carried Pennsylvania. Trump carried Michigan. Uh, these are the kinds of states where Joe Biden could do well. Right. I actually had this theory that the Democrats actually um, accidentally splintered their own party. And I actually think Nancy Pelosi, the Chuck Schumers, the Joe Bidens, they're actually more moderate. But mm-hmm. They pretended to be far left because they just wanted to oppose Trump. Right. So they just were like anything anti-Trump we agree with. Green right. New Deal. Fine. Right. But then it actually brought forth these real leftists, these real um, socialists. socialists yes. Right. Mm-hmm. And it gave birth to the AOCs. And now their party is sort of imploding and they're they're reckoning with with anti-Semitism and mm-hmm. the things that are coming out of their mouths. And it's a free for all. And I think that we're in the midst of a, com- a total political realignment right now because of it. Mm-hmm. And it's their own fault. Right. They could have just been sensible and responding to Trump, but they just couldn't do it. They had to pretend that he was the second coming of Hitler. And now they kind of have to contend with it. And I'm kind of having fun watching. Mm-hmm. It, it is fun. <laughs> it mm-hmm. is fun to watch. Mm-hmm. You you always do the great memes on Instagram. And I'm like, they're so good. <laughs> and I'm like, that's exactly what's going on right yeah. now. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a free for all. It's going to be really entertaining. Yeah. And, and somehow anything that goes wrong, I'll be to blame. You know me. Mm-hmm. I'm, I get blamed for everything these days. I'll take that. (laughs) All right. Well, Larry, we do this thing at the end of every podcast. Well, where we want our guests to leave a, to launch a vibration into the world. So you get two minutes. Launch a vibration. Launch a vibration. So whatever you say for two minutes, it, let's say it falls on everybody's ears in the entire world and if in their own language, of course, whatever language they live in. Wait, wait, that's your camera. Bub's got the two minutes on the clock. Okay. On your mark, get set. Larry Elder. My two minute vibration is to all young people in this country irrespective of race, irrespective of of color, irrespective of of gender. This is the greatest country God ever created. You hit the lottery when you were born in America. And if you were lucky enough to have two loving parents who helped to raise you, you hit the lottery again. Work hard, invest in yourself. My father always told my brothers and me the following, hard work wins. You get out of life what you put into it. You cannot control the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before you bitch, moan and whine about what somebody did to you or said to you. Go to the nearest mirror, look at it and say, what could I have done to change the outcome? And finally, no matter how good you are, how hard you work, how ethical you are, sooner or later, bad things are going to happen. How you deal with those bad things will tell whether or not we've raised a man or a woman. Wow. That might have been my the favorite one we've ever done. <laughs> right? That was so Booyah! amazing. Right? Shh, <laughs> mic drop. The 49.127. Right? That we've had. Yeah. Most people are like, what am I going to say? That was, um, America needs to hear that. This episode was made possible by a generous donation from Bruce Bender. Thank you guys for watching the latest episode of The Candace Owens Show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As many of you guys already know, PragerU is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means we need your help to keep all of our content free to the public. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. I would really appreciate your support.